to cover. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Great group of kids there. Some of you have already been to the ark, haven't you? You mean, it's, uh, it's, it's quite an amazing thing about creation. To understand creation is a powerful thing. Uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that even today. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, are you comfortable? I had an opportunity to take a little scooter ride this week, and uh, uh, just we just spontaneously took off. And while I'm riding, I'm, I'm looking at, I, I'm always observing, I'm always thinking, I'm always running through things, and I realize just how much the earth regenerates, how much it puts back in itself. As a matter of fact, and I'll, I'll, I'll share the scripture with you later, but the scripture says that in the, in the book of Genesis that God instituted seed time and harvest. Seed time harvest. In other words, you put seed in the ground, you give it some time, there's going to be a harvest. The important thing of that is, is looking at, at our generation, all of creation invests in its future. Uh, the, the, the trees are already shedding seed right now, dropping the seed, and it's, it's reinvesting in its future. This is why I'm telling you that evolution is a damnable doctrine, because there's no way it's going to work. But when you think about what God put in, in, and even told us that life is about this, so the seed goes into the ground, brings it prepares for the winter, and it understands, the earth understands delays for the purpose of a better tomorrow. We have to pick up on that. When you have no investment in life, you have no determination to live. I found that when people decide that there's no more life, and this is why I pray all the time, God give them purpose of life and length of days. As long as i got a purpose to get up, as long as I have a reason for doing, I'm going to stay with it. And that has to do with investing into the lives of people. You are investing right now, which is going to determine what your future is going to be like. Every talent needs a stage. Every talent. When I, when I see athletes that have talents, they're looking for a stage to, to show that off. Musically, this morning, as you know, when, when, we, uh, when we went up and uh, took time to hire David and, and Tony... Uh, you know, Tony was, was just, as a matter of fact, just found out she was pregnant with, with J.J. at that time in Oklahoma City. I had no idea she could sing. I had no idea. And hear this song this morning. Yeah. Done so well. Every talent needs a stage. It needs a place to, to, to project and to say something. Every dream will need financing. Every message needs a method of conveyance. When you have a message to share it, you need to have a place where you can convey it. That's why I do appreciate that there is a right way to use social media, amen, to convey something to get it out. Ideas die without the funds to realize them. The idea that... that uh, you know, some of you say, well, I ain't got kids. But don't you want to see kids go and understand the ark and what went on there? So, so they, there's an idea there that's being projected for them. Without the funds, then we can't realize that. 1 Corinthians 9, Paul speaking, he said, For it is written in the law of Moses, talking about the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, Do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. Everybody say hope. hope. Say harvest. harvest. I need you into this message. Say hope. hope. Amen. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have the right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. And let me stop there a minute and say this. It's not about boasting about myself or those that are ministering with me. But understand, we're not office people that just sit around and do nothing. Uh, as ministry goes, we are always out among the people. We're out among, we visit, we, we take care of, we, we, we're, we're producers, we're effective. Amen. We look for opportunities to, to be a blessing. And what he's saying here is, is, is that if we're doing this, don't we have a right? By the way, I've worked two jobs, three jobs. When I first started a church, I was working three jobs a week, plus pastoring the church to try to get it up off the ground. And I look forward to the day when it got off the ground, and I remember I finally bought a new truck. Finally bought a new truck. And I thought to myself, and this is how I thought, Steve, I don't want to buy something that somebody's going to look at me and say, well, that preacher's making too much money. 
So I bought a truck with a five-speed uh, transmission in it. I didn't even go for an automatic. It was a blue Dodge Dakota. I was so proud of that blue truck when I got it. And sure enough, as soon as I got in the church, somebody started criticizing that that church pays him too much money. Do you know what it was? It was somebody who criticized who never gave. I always it's the people that never give. I had a meeting here in this church one time, and I brought in a, a funeral home just to tell you that one day you're going to die. That's what I want, And I wanted to let you know that you're going to need a plot. Gonna, I wasn't trying to promote the funeral home, but there was one man that argued that during, in that meeting, said, the only reason you're doing this is you're getting a cut off the plots that we buy. And I've never got a cut from a funeral home off a plot you bought. I've, the, 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 it's the craziest thing I ever heard. He fussed and argued, and he thought it was all, and, and I thought, okay, let, you know what I'll do? I'll go check his finances and see what, man, never gave. Right. Now, within our church for years, was not a giver. Died six months later. We had to figure out a way to bury him. Right. Had him cremated. Burn it. <laughs> Are you hearing the preacher now? Sometimes you just got to be honest with folk about stuff. Because I, I want to pastor a church that grabs hold of this and gets hold of it. So Paul's saying, look, if, if, if we're going to sow seed into you, we ought to also earn our right to live among you. So then he goes, if others have the right of support from you, shouldn't we have it the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. By the way, I lost that mentality real quick about whether I was concerned with whether you thought I should drive whatever I wanted to drive. So I went and got me a hot rod. Lost it in a flood, but I'm looking to get me another one eventually. My wife don't know it, bless her heart, but I... I, I, I I, I, I was on that car gurus the other day, and I, I, I went after one. I threw a price down. I got an email said he didn't denied my price. <laughs> but I'm trying at it, man. I'm pushing again, Dwayne, trying to get me another old Mopar. Okay, back over here. <laughs> Bless her heart. She, the only reason Lori comes to church is to find out what I've been up to. <laughs> she tells me that all the time. She said, why well, I hear about that at church and not at and then my, don't you know, on the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So if I want to do this, there has to be a living, not just for me, but for the ministers that God has stuck with me. Amen. I say stuck in a kind way. Amen. Father, we bless you. We thank you for the word of God. We have hope for a harvest. We thank you for your goodness. We share this hope. And if we're going to plow, if we're going to plow, let us hope for some great things in the future. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. Come on, give me a big amen. 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 I, I love that there in verse 10 where, where it says, surely he says this for us, doesn't he? And it's written, if we're going to plow, I, there's something about plowing. And he used the word hope. Hope is expectation. The cord that connects you to an expected end. Believing for something great. I have a hope of eternity. I have a hope for a better future. I have a hope that my kids are going to figure this out someday. Amen. I have a hope to, it's to anticipate with pleasure and confidence. To cherish and desire with anticipation. To desire. Some of you have a hope for a vacation. And you hope it's going to be a good thing when you get to go. Those are great things to have in your life. Proverbs 23, 18 says, There is surely a future hope for you, for you, your hope will not be cut off. Surely there is a hope. Now, he talks about preaching here, that there's something about, there is power in preaching. Preaching is what turned my life around. When I heard, and I love good preaching. I love to hear the word of God expounded in such a way. I, I, I asked my pastor today, and this is kind of a fun thing, but I said, Pastor, what you going to preach on? He said, I'm preaching on Peter and that boat. I said, what are you talking about? He said, the only reason God used Peter is because he had a boat. <laughs> I thought to myself, I told you that three weeks ago. <laughs> but when you're old like he is, he's already forgotten where he heard it. <laughs> so he's going to preach on something. I'm so we, we, I did something about, no, I told a man this week, I said, I appreciate all you do for us. I appreciate what you do for the church and how you do this, that, and the other. And he looked at me and he said, Pastor, it's my boat. It's my boat. I have the gift 
of rebuilding engines and doing this, that, and the other. It's my boat. And so, in other words, he caught hold of the word of God and the preaching. First Peter 1.23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. By this, so this, the preaching of this book, is seed that goes out every time we share it. No matter where we share it from, it's seed that goes out. And when it gets in your heart, it's not corruptible, but it's incorruptible. In other words, it turns your life around. It changes you. Last week, we had 30-something guys show up from Shiloh Ministries, and I was blessed to listen to these guys testify and share that it was the, the incorruptible seed that changed them, took the addiction of drugs and alcohol away from them. And there was hope in their life. And, you know, and the invitation, you got to come and preach, and we need to hear you more. And I thought, I love, I love preaching the word. Romans 10, 14. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Preaching, my friend, is plowing. Yeah, it's, pl it's looking at the faces of people that look like this. <laughs> it's like staring at cracked up hard ground. And looking at it and saying to yourself, if I can get this plow into the ground, I'll make them smile from the front row to the back. It's, it's when you're preaching and you start seeing their countenance change. And you realize, uh-huh, I got you now. You're getting hold of this. And the more you plow, the more the ground opens up, the more it's able to receive the seed. And the seed goes in and begins to change them. And one of the great principles I learned in life is a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Where is that in the Bible? It's not. It's in Mary Poppins. But I promise you, if you get folk laughing, you can just keep shoving truth down them. Amen? You can keep sharing with them. There's nothing like it. There's nothing like the opportunity to deliver life to hungry people through the Word. When I picture a country picnic and people enjoying themselves around the food and smiles that accompany that fellowship, give us this day our daily bread, my friend, that's preaching. When, when people are enjoying the word and they're catching hold of it. Why do you preach, Pastor? Because I see value in humanity. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes in him, I believe. What a song, what a song. I believe whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's something about hearing the word and realizing that people have value. And I know there are times when we look at people that are struggling with addictions, and you say to yourself, I'm tired of it, but, but believe, I'm telling you, that can turn around. Amen. That can change. You've got to keep having hope. You've got to keep believing. And the answer is hope. God has entrusted all his work into our hands. God has a dream for everyone and has given everyone a gift of influence to influence people and to guide people to him. Everybody, I believe, has that gift. But without knowing Christ, we can use our gifts in the wrong way. And if not careful, we can destroy people. People have value. People have value. When you pick that up, you know, Saul, Saul was known as Saul uh, uh, before he became Paul. And he was, his job was killing Christians. And he went around with a writ, a piece of paper that gave him permission to kill Christians. It was against the law to preach the gospel of Christ. And he went and he found a young boy named Stephen. And he told Stephen, he said, son, you're, you're doing wrong and we're going to have to take you out. And Stephen preached the gospel to him. And we understand Stephen was about 16 years of age. He was a young man when he preached. And if you read the, the, the sermon of, of Stephen, he laid it out. And the scripture says that Paul held the coats of those who picked up stones and stoned that boy to death. And the scripture says that Stephen and looked up into heaven and saw Jesus sitting at the right hand. He had a vision of where he was going. His life was cut short, but his mission and his message was powerful. And it began to affect uh, Saul. And on, Saul's on his way somewhere, and God blinds him and sends him to a man's house to get the blinders knocked off. And ever since, he became Paul and preached the epistles, all the epistles, the Galatians, the uh, first, second Timothy, uh, 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 Romans, Corinthians. All of them came from Paul. Philippians, while he was in jail, he shared these messages with us. What a tremendous story that he shared. And, but, but what happened was the word of God turned him around. God made us valuable. David said in Psalm 139, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. Please understand this. Life starts in the womb. 
And I know I'm preaching to the choir. You guys understand. But there are times that we sympathize with people that have a demonic attitude about children. That if one way they want to save them somewhere that are already alive, but they want to kill the ones that are in the womb. Amen. There has to be an understanding that there is life. There's life inside there. Yeah. Amen. There's something about it. And God knit you inside the womb. In other words, he was preparing you. He knew you were showing up on, well, I'm just a mistake, you know. You don't know how. I have three adopted kids. Don't tell me their mistakes. Come on. You don't know how they got here. If I told you the story of my three children, how they got here, it would break your heart. You'd say, well, it sounds like sin to me. It sounds like wrongdoing to me. It don't to me. It sounds like God figured out a way to get them into my life. Amen. Amen. He was working a way out. He knew them when they showed up. It wasn't their fault. It ain't the kid's fault. Amen. Quit acting like it. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to me. In other words, David said, you already planned my life. All I got to do is step into it. I just got to keep stepping in. You ordained it for me. Your eyes saw my unformed body. Well, then he goes on in verse 17. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. What a beautiful, poetic thought that God thinks about you like the sands of the sea. Or sands on the, on the, on the, on the shore. I know that's, that's hard to fathom. But the, he's God and you're not. I, when I'm traveling, I think, God knows them people. He knows them. I, I, I saw a little, uh, a little thing, Pan American Games. I didn't even know it was on. But I looked over there, and it was in Lima, Peru. And it showed that vast city. And I thought, man, I've never seen that city before. It showed it from a, an aerial view. I thought, God knows every one of them people there. Right. Amen. He knew where there's one. He can talk their language. Yeah. Amen. He understands them. The principle of plowing, he that plows should plow in hope. Do not plow. Listen, plowing is an important thing. Again, it's, it's tearing up the ground. It's preparing it for the seed. Do not plow unequally. The scripture says this. Do not plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Don't plow with an ox and a donkey yoked together. Now, you may not want to hear this. But the scripture says, even of relationships, be careful. Be careful who you yoke up with. Because they're going to roll at different speeds. You cannot hook up a helper and a jackass and expect anything good to come from it. Can I get an amen? All it's going to do is cause a problem. Now, I can say that, and you say, oh, oh but my heart is. Listen, well, eventually that heart going to cool off, and you're going to realize real quick what you hooked up with is stubborn and stupid. <laughs> but he's so cute. He's stubborn and stupid. But you don't understand. I'm afraid I do. <laughs> I biblically understand. Yeah. Amen. Hook up. With the right and plow with the right ones. The purpose of plowing is to prepare the soil for the seed. Planting comes after the plowing. There are reasons people don't plow. One thing is if you turn over the soil, you never know what you're going to find. Some are nervous about what they're going to find. I remember being out there on the, on the property. There are times that we, we plowed up stuff. We, I, I furrowed up some ground. And metal started popping up out of the ground. And I realized this was an old burial spot on the property. And I was afraid to keep digging because I knew the former owner had three former husbands. And nobody knew where they were. And I was afraid to keep on plowing. Amen. In case I would turn up something that shouldn't happen. They do not know what will turn up. Second, they allow their season to dictate their plowing. They say, well, you know, this is the wrong. There is no season, uh, a season off for reaching people for Christ. Amen. Amen. You got to stay after this day. The other reason people don't plow is simply because they're lazy. They're lazy. They don't want to plant seed. And I'm not just talking about the preacher here. I'm talking about you too. Planting seed, going after, trying to help. Uh, the, the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. There's a reason why a lot of folk get near a, a, a place in their life when they don't have anything. The reason is, is they didn't plow. 
They didn't sow. And now they expect to reap what you did. Mm. It's important that all of us invest. Can I get an amen? amen. And all of, the power of plowing is hope. Hosea 10, 11, and I got to move very quickly here. Let me skip through this verse. Uh, get it. Judah, the Bible says Judah shall plow. Now, all of you know through preaching that Judah is, is the good time band. There were 12 tribes, and Judah being one of those tribe leaders, he's the good time band. He's, he's the, the praise. Send Judah first. It, it's something about it. Praise plows. When you come into church, I was, you know, I always start in the back of the church. I, I walk around, and I look back here, and I watch some of you, and I think, we're not plowing this morning. Ain't nobody, plow. only a handful of people want to plow this morning. Because when you plow, when you worship, it opens your heart up for the word. Now, if, if you stove up right now, it means you didn't worship. Amen. So when you worship, it's, ah, oh, I, God, I love you. I love, and I'm not going to tell you, when you, Tony, when you hit that last song, there's something plowing started taking place in here. I can hear it coming in the back of my ear. The people started plowing in here. There's something about beginning to plow. And when we do that, we begin to open up the heavens, amen, so we can receive the word of God and take it into our lives. Why is that important? Because later it's going to bring forth some fruit. The most difficult thing in farming is getting the soil ready for the seed. Praise prepares the heart for the word. Plow. And sometimes I'm going to tell you, worship is like plowing. <laughs> Josiah, it's like, it's like I'm, I'm going, and the people go, and they got that old religious song, you know. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I shall not be, I shall not be moved. I'll sit right here and hinder those around me. I shall not be moved. I'm satisfied just where I am. I shall not be moved. Mm -hmm. That's us. Astros hit a home run. Hey! Look at them Astros. Yeah! We screaming in the hall. Go Cowboys! Look at them Texas! Woo! Come to church. <laughs> Greatest thing ever happened. It's death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now you're plowing. Now you're doing something. You're, you're moving ahead to plow, my friend. Amen. There's something about that. It, it, the plow has, it has a point on it. Plowing was also used as an ox gold, the scripture would call it. it. It broke up the fallow ground to cut into or to open, to proceed steadily. And, and, and here's the big word, laboriously. In other words, there are times, look, I, I used a tiller when I was a kid. I got to use a tiller. Before then, I used it. And some would use horses and mules and things of that nature and, and, and cattle. But, but there's something about still using a plow to break up that ground. And even with tractors now, they do it. But Shamgar, the Bible says of him, he used an ox gold. He plowed Abraham. He had promises, but he had to get the Canaanites out of the land. Caleb said, this mountain is my mountain, but he had to get the, the Anakites out. Amen. Adam, Adam had a garden, but he had a snake in it. Your garden always going to have something in it. That you're going to have to deal with. The solution for plowing through is for every situation, God has a solution. Amen. And your attitude has to be enough is enough. I got to plow. I got to believe God. There will be no production without first plowing. There has to be work. Second, then there's sowing. Third, then there's the favor of God. Rain. I was outside mowing grass yesterday. And while I was mowing, it started raining. It ain't raining in a couple of weeks. And when that rain started falling, I thought, I ain't getting off this mower. I'll get wet right here. I just let it fall on me. It felt so good. And, and, it, and it reminds me, the grass will keep coming up. It'll keep on moving. So first, they got to be plowed. Second, you got to keep sowing. Third, it's the favor of God in your life. Believing for that, that activation. Something's going to take place. Use what you have and stop using excuses. What you work with is what you win with. You got to stay with it. No more, no more excuses. The application, the understanding is God always teaches through orientation. Again, Genesis eight twenty two. As long as this, the earth endures, as long as there's planet Earth, there will be seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night, never cease. Life is plowing and enjoying the fruit of our labor. There's something about plowing. You know, if you're going to have if you're going to have carrots, you got, I like carrots. Carrots are good for your, huh? 
They say for your eyes. Help you see. All those with glasses say amen. amen. Uh-huh. I love bacon, lettuce, tomato sandwiches. Woo, there's something about it. There's something about having tomato. And man, when somebody tells me, Pastor, we got some homegrown tomatoes. We want, want to give you. Now you're talking. You can smell that tomato. You go in that store-bought tomatoes, ain't the same. But I'm on my scooter, and I'm riding by them little produce trucks. When you're on a scooter, scooters are wonderful for aromas. <laughs> See, you don't smell it in your vehicle. But if you're on a scooter, there's something about the aroma. I can smell fresh-cut grass. You have no idea what manure is like until you're on a scooter. <laughs> If you get behind an 18-wheeler hauling cattle at night in a rainstorm, that's when you know you're a real biker. Because you can't go around them. It's at night. You're stuck behind them. Woo! And all you smell is fertilizer. It ain't nothing like Texas. Or a little cayenne pepper. Oh, man, to make things better. When I was a kid, one of the things I hated is when my daddy said to me, go out there, son, and cut that okra. Oh, I hated cutting okra. See, you might like to eat okra. That's because you never cut okra. If you've ever cut okra, then you've got to put on long sleeves and, 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 and cloth gloves and a sharp paring knife. They go out there and cut that okra. And you, as you're moving through it, you'll feel one of them vines rub up next to your neck. And you'll start that itching. Oh, and you're just like you itch forever. And you 10, 11, 12 year old, you start sweating and itching. But you can't have that okra unless you plant that seed. And then when you get around October, man, people, they, get, they go crazy about these in the church. I don't know why. But everybody got to go out there and get them a little pumpkin seed. Amen. They got to have the pumpkin places to have them great. And they'll grow them giant pumpkins. But then pumpkins all start as a seed. Tomatoes all start as a seed. Everything that you buy in the produce start as a seed. See, the issue, church, is where I sow is where I'm going to reap from. If I sow into the ground, it's coming out of the ground. I sow to a sinful nature, it comes back that way. If I sow in the spirit, it comes back that way. What I sow is what I reap. I would never plant okra expecting to get pumpkins. Hello. So if I'm planting one thing, I'm going to, I ain't going to get the other. So if I sow love, I'm getting love. If I sow discord, I don't know why my family is so messed up. Because you won't shut up. <laughs> You're sowing discord all the time, getting this and against that one. It, uh, I think this, the, the Greek word is angst. That ain't true. <laughs> but it sounds good, don't it? You're starting to angst up there in your family. You're sowing discord, hatred, malice, meanness, gossip, and it's coming back on you. But if I sow love and hope, if I sow kindness, if I'm good toward others, if I sow that seed, I expect it to come back to me. It works the same way in the physical. The world has figured this thing out. The church is still behind on it. Because we think all the thing, the preacher is trying to get rich. That, that is so far from the truth in most churches. See, the problem was we went through what is known as the Great Depression. And when we went through that, churches went through it too. And we started uh, espousing an idea, well, let's just, you know, that poverty somehow is connected with godliness. Poverty is connected with curses. Not with, with godliness. God wants you to prosper as your soul prospers. I can walk you through scripture after scripture how God wants you blessed. Well, Pastor, it ain't been that way for me. Well, start turning it around. Start sowing in such a way. See, I learned as a little boy what poverty was like. I had an outhouse. 
pick cotton as a kid. Uh, again, uh, drew water up in a bucket, brought it in the house, heated on the stove. To put, had one heater in the mornings when it was cold in, in, up in North Alabama. And everybody gathered around that one heater in the morning. It had heat on all sides. You straddled that thing like that right there carefully. <laughs> then your brother would come by and yank your pant leg and burn inside your leg once it heated up. See that? But I'm going to tell you what I learned through it. I didn't learn that I was godly. I didn't learn that everything was great. I learned it through the struggles of life. It's the one thing I can't give my kids. It's the one thing you can't give your kids. Very few in here give their kids what you had. And that's the word struggle. It was struggling that made you who you are. It was struggle that blessed you. It was just struggling in life. See, I said this to, uh, I've said it to my daughters. I've said it to, to my kids. I've tried to say, but, but the truth of the matter is, we don't let our kids, well, we're not in that generation anymore. Right. I can't send them out to pick cotton. I can't, I can't just go, you know what, I'm going to make my kids struggle. I'm shutting the toilet off in the house, and I'm going to build a little shack out back. <laughs> Who thinks like that? Nobody thinks like that. We think to ourselves, I had it that way, but I ain't going to let my kids go through that. So I want to bless them with running water and electricity. Yeah, you know, uh, some of you I know still got window units. I understand that. God bless you. You got, you got air conditioning. But I remember when we first got our window units, my daddy got a 110 stuck in his bedroom. It was the only air conditioning in the house. Where was it? In my daddy's bedroom. Now, I didn't care. How do I think? I had to put it in my kids' room first because I don't want my kids to struggle like I did. My daddy didn't think that way. <laughs> my daddy put it in because he the one doing the work. He the one doing the sweating, and he going to sleep good at night. He don't care how you sleep. He going to sleep good at night. We all, you know what that did? It caused all of us to go get in bed with daddy. <laughs> we don't want to hang out with daddy because daddy's prosperous. Daddy got active. I remember we finally got a 220 stuck in the living room. Oh, man, it stuck there. I forgot all about it. It hadn't been there but a couple of weeks, and I, I just got back. Uh, I was... Uh, Playing football, I had to go get my examination and all that. So I, I laid off smoking for a couple of months. And, and then I got out behind the, uh, the house. And I thought, man, I, I'm Jones in here. And I fired up one. And I hotboxed that thing. And then I hotboxed another one. And then my mama yelled, Jay, where you at? And I took off running around the house. And if, you ain't, if you've gone a little while without smoking and you fire up one, you hotbox it. Y'all know what I'm talking about when I say hotbox? You just burn that thing down. And I went running around the house. I was dizzy as I could be. Didn't even know it. And I forgot all about that air conditioner. And I hit the side of that thing, laid me out on the ground. My mama come and look at me. She said, you all right? And I said, yeah, mom forgot all about that air conditioner. <laughs> These stories just keep coming back in my head. That's where I was raised. But I don't want to go back to that. I thank God for where I'm at right now. When we went through the flood, I, I, it's like I lost so much. But yet I was so appreciative for the struggle. Because it made me appreciate the house I was back into now. There's something about sowing. Say, how I sow is how I reap. Look, look at Luke 6.37. Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures. This is out of the message. Criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. What's he saying? That if I sow picking on people, looking at their failures, criticizing their faults, I'm going to get the same thing. Is that what it says? I get the same treatment. Don't condemn those who are down. That hardness can boomerang. What's that saying? That's saying if I sow it, it come back at me. It's going to boomerang. That's all it's saying to me again. Be easy on people. You'll find life a lot easier. So if I'm easy, I'm easy. Sound like that Commodore song, don't it? I was going to try it, but I can't. Come on. <laughs> Give away your life, you'll find life given back. What is that? That's sowing and reaping. If I give my life, I get my life back. But not merely giving back, giving back with Give it back with bonus. Give it back with bonus. bonus and blessing. If I give my life away, I get bonus and blessing. Giving, not getting this away. Generosity begots generosity. That the more generous I am, the more it comes back. James 5 says, Meanwhile, friends, wait patiently for the master's arrival. You see, farmers do this all the time, waiting for their valuable crops, patiently letting the rain do its slow but sure work. Let the rain work on it. 
Be patient like that. Stay steady and strong. The master could arrive at any time. Friends, don't complain about each other. A far greater complaint could be lodged against you, you know. The judge is standing around the corner. So I leave you with a few thoughts. There is one loss no one can afford to experience. It's the loss of hope. If you lose hope, well, my friend, you lose motivation. The ability to learn is gone. Hope is such a powerful thing. So he says when you plow, plow with hope. Hope does some powerful things. If I get our servant leaders to come up. Somebody say this church matters. So when I am investing, God invested everything he had in you and I. And that's why he's determined to not have you fail. The disciples invested their lives for Christ. Therefore, they were willing to go to death with him. Now, I, I know what the scripture says quite a bit about giving. This is what gets me. This is the same seed as that. And as long as it's in my pocket, it's like the seed that's in this packet. It's not going to do any good. Long as I, I'm not talking about your investments. But I'm talking about this investment. Investing here. When you invest in the house. When you invest in ministry. When you say, I'm going to take what I've got. And I'm going to invest the seed here. You don't know how it's going to turn out. Honestly. A couple of years ago. We could have never done what we've done. But to take 16 years. And invest in such a way. That God has blessed us with our churches. He's blessed us with our properties. He's blessed us with great ministers. He's blessed us with a great band. He's blessed us with, with our youth. He, he's blessed us with our kids. He blessed us with our nurse. He keeps blessing us. But he cannot bless. Listen. He, last week I made a, a dumb statement. I, I, I held up my phone. And I said, Who, who's got a phone? And, and hand, me, hand me your phone. And I said, what's your password? Uh, never mind. Uh, <laughs> So I said, who, who, you know, my point was this. I wanted to say, this phone here is, uh, if I don't pay for it, I don't get to keep it. But on this phone is my, my news, my social connections, my ability to text and connect with other people. It's on this phone if I don't pay for it. And I messed up last week because I held the phone, my phone up and I said that. And I said, who, who in here got, got one of these free? And a lady sitting on the front row yelled, I got mine for free. She got it through uh, your tax money. Ruined my whole <laughs> illustration. And I looked down at her, and I only thought I had one. I said it out loud to her. I said, you're welcome. If you got it for free, you're welcome. Because somebody else is paying for your stuff. If you're sitting in church without investing, you're welcome. Because somebody else has been paying for you to get to do that. Right, Amen. If you hear me preach, you're welcome. Because somebody else is taking care of my salary. Oh, I'm mad now. I'm going to another church. Now, I don't want to be mean. I want you to catch it. I want you to understand. There are people in here that learn how to sow. They understand sowing. They understand that they're going to reap it back. It works spiritually. It works physically. It works with your body. And if I sold it, if I want a BLT, I better get to plowing. I better get to sowing. Hey, I better get to feeding the hog. Amen. I better get ready to take care of some stuff because we some bacon-eating people in this church. Mm -hmm. If I want cayenne, I don't. Well, I got to take care of my eyesight. I need a carrot every now and then. Peas and carrots. Everybody catch this? Where was that? I got, do I have any slides left? Not that I'm looking for a gift, Paul said in Philippians, but I'm looking for what may be accredited to your account. <laughs> your account. Life is about investing and withdrawals. I, my marriage really in bad shape. Investing 
and withdrawals. The church is going down. Investing and withdrawals. You can't make a withdrawal until you've made an investment. I have received full payment and even more. I'm amply supplied. Now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent, they are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. And my God will meet all your needs. There it is. According to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father. If I take that out of context, I'll just read verse 19. Back up a slide. Back up another slide. Not that I'm looking for a gift, but I'm looking for that which may be credited to your account. Now go and go to the, the next slide. There. And my God will meet all your needs. God meets our needs when we sow our seed. Amen. Amen. He's not going to meet your need till you sow. It's, he just put it in. He said, listen, God, it's in Genesis. I told you. Seed, time, harvest. Put some seed in the ground. Give us some time. You're going to get a harvest. But if you don't put a seed in the ground... I don't care how much time. I don't. If I stare at this and say, okay, I'm waiting. But if I don't put that in the ground, I ain't going to have no okra. If I don't put this in the ground, I don't have no finances. I've got to learn to put it back in the ground. Amen. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you for your people. Thank you for the word of God that goes forth. I thank you, Lord, that you have blessed me. You have blessed the ministries of the little country church. God, you have provided for us. But Lord, I'm praying that it would be accredited to those in this house. That they would be blessed and there would be something put toward their treasures in heaven. By learning how to sow here on this earth. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you need to tie the 